Well, in the dark plants are certainly attainable too. That's like that's why I'm like it's not not attainable. Um, they're not. So, <laughs> so there could be. Well, hi everybody. My name is Jane Beggs Joles, and I'm the landscape program manager for Proven Winners Color Choice. So, Proven Winners Color Choice is the woody ornamental part of the Proven Winners organization, and Spring Meadow Nursery, where I work is where all of the new woody ornamentals for the brand are selected. So we don't just select plants, we actually breed them. So I'm really excited today to introduce you to Megan Matai, who is our plant breeder. And she's going to talk a bit about what she does, why she does it, and how she got to Spring Meadow Nursery. So hi, Megan. Hey, Jane. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, let's start out by telling people a little bit about yourself. I know you're from South Dakota. Beautiful state. How, how did how did this happen? So I guess yeah, like you said, I'm from South Dakota. I grew up and my parents always gardened. We had a big hobby vegetable garden in the back, and my mother flower gardened as well. And so like every weekend that we weren't camping, we were working in we were at a greenhouse or working in the yard. So. From there, I was just always really interested in plants. I would do different different little experiments. I had to hide them because if my mother found them, she thought they were kind of messy, and so she'd always throw them away. And when I was in fifth grade, one of our science books talked about grafting, and so I tried grafting a pear and an apple tree together. How'd that go? Not very well. Yeah. I, I used like sort of like a electrical tape to tape it together, but it was just uh, it's fun looking back now, and yeah. seeing how interested I was in that at that age. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. And I think you you worked at a garden center? Yeah, so uh, when I was 14. In South Dakota, you can drive at a really young age, so I actually got my first car when I was 14 and then uh, <laughs> could drive myself to the garden center. Nice. And yeah, so it was a local garden center. South Dakota is mainly zone four. So we focused on um, a lot of more native type shrubs and xeric type shrubs or shrubs that can handle uh, very hot, dry, tough conditions. Yeah. It's a harsh climate. It is, yeah. yeah. Not just cold, but heat and pretty alkaline soil if I'm Very correct. alkaline yeah. soil, yeah, very clay. Yeah. Um, very low moisture. Yeah, it's a rugged place. It is, yeah. yeah. From there, I decided to pursue a bachelor's degree in horticulture science, went to the University of Minnesota. Yeah. And even though it's roughly along the same latitude, it, it was just different, you know, soils were better drained, soils were, you know, more balanced, a uh, lot more moisture, so like the plant diversity, even just from state to state, yeah. Minnesota's very cold as well. I was going to say, there aren't <laughs> very many people who move to Minnesota and say, wow, this Woo! is this is like such an easy climate, you know, but coming right. from South Dakota, it, it was. It was, yep. So why did you choose the University of Minnesota? Well, I mean, a couple of different reasons. One, they are um, a land-grant university, very progressive in the amount of horticulture and plant science research that comes out of that university. They still were fairly close to home, and they also have a reciprocity agreement oh, with South okay. Dakota, so money yeah. is always a, that was a... Sure. Well, that's an important yeah. thing. Um, and uh, something, I guess, if we have any college students watching this, uh, or Perspective college students, reciprocity amongst states can be an important thing. Yes, yeah. yeah, very much so. Okay, so what did you like about Minnesota? and what? Tell us about that experience. From right as a freshman, I was able to jump into, I participated in, it's an undergraduate research opportunities program, or Europe, and I got hooked up with a professor, Dr. Neil Anderson there, who manages the floriculture breeding program. So I worked for my first two years there designing an experiment with a wide hybridization in Onagraceae. So these are annuals, perennials, epilobium, which is fireweed, gora, and uh, enothera. And so one of the advantages of doing wide hybridization or interspecific crosses is to create sterile plants or to reduce the fertility or invasiveness of okay. plants. And so. It was a study about a year and a half long of making crosses. We found out that they needed to be embryo rescued, which is a process of taking those crosses before they fully set seed and fully mature and bringing them up into the lab. 
sterilizing them, plating them out, and hoping to get germination in the lab for those. Wow. So you have just in a couple of I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry. You've, you've dropped a lot of information um, for us to, to kind of unpack because these are some concepts that are really, uh, I think, foreign to a lot sure. of people. Um, you know, many people think that, uh, one, they think plants just kind of show up, which sometimes they do. You know, sometimes right. there's what we call a sport Correct. of a branch that just looks different and we can propagate it and it's cool. But most of the plants that we introduce have taken a lot of work and they've required plant breeding. So I think we need to start with some kind of basic concepts of plant breeding. Um, and, you know, the first is, uh, you know, what... At its most basic, what would that mean? Um, usually, so to begin a breeding program, they always start with an idea, a want, or a desire. So in that kind of an instance, we had a want or desire was to, cre um, to reduce the fertility of these common everyday plants. Okay. So, Why would you want to reduce the fertility of a plant? Um, to prevent plants uh, from becoming invasive or even just troublesome in your yeah. yard. Okay, so we have a goal. We're trying to reduce the the seed, the viable seeds. Right. So, just people like seeds can happen, but not be viable. Correct. Which is not good if you are planting corn. You want viable seeds, but if you have a rose of Sharon in your backyard, you really don't want all those seeds to be viable because then you're pulling rose of Sharon up. Right. Everywhere. Right. So we're looking for either no seeds or not viable seeds. Right. Correct. Um, and one other attribute that kind of just is beneficial that comes along with creating um, infertile varieties is a lot of times their bloom time is lengthened or increased or you'll get another cycle of bloom too. Okay. And is that uh, the way I understand that that's the, the plant doesn't have to put so much energy into producing seed. It can produce more, put more of its energy into producing flowers. Correct. Okay, yep. and those flowers might and usually do still produce pollen, nectar, you know, they still do flower type stuff. Correct, yeah, they're still um, just as beneficial for okay. insects. Insects are, yeah, usually still visiting those flowers just yeah. as much as... They're just not closing it by producing a seed. Right, and that comes within the plant. The plant yeah. itself is not getting the signal to, to make seed. Okay, okay. So, um, we, we know what we want, now we're going to breed plants. So it starts typically where we just are looking at maybe a particular species. So when we are talking about plants, there's the genus, and then there's the species, and then there's the variety. So we might take two varieties of the same species and try and breed them, and then we would have another variety of that species, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Um, so that, so Jane's talking about intraspecific crosses. Okay. So you're crossing two plants that are fairly similar. They're pretty the same. close. Yep. Pretty close. Yep. One might have a pink flower and one might have a blue flower. Right. But they're but the same. We might also do different species. Correct. So in terms of, um, of trying to create a, a sterile plant, one, one method would be an intergeneric cross. So crossing two different genera together, as well as sometimes two different species um, as well. If they're different enough, then sometimes they will create a sterile plant. So think of a, think of a mule. Uh, right. So a hybrid between a donkey and a horse. Uh, you get a you get a mule, and that's that's your endpoint. Um, so that mule can't go on to make any. They will try. <laughs> they, they will try. I don't know about that, James. They do. Jane they do. I, that. <laughs> but nothing's going to happen with it. Okay. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens with flowers. Like sure. they, They're trying. They're but trying. If it's, if it's a mule flower, it's not. Right. Right. So it might, to, to do this, that might be as simple as you, what, like 
putting two plants in a room together and hoping they get along? Or? I mean, usually with some type of pollinator, uh, okay. so an insect like a bee or flies to help move and help facilitate that, that pollination. The majority of it is done by actual hand pollination, so going in, collecting the pollen, we bring that pollen back to the lab and usually let it dry down for a 24 hour period and then we bring that back the next day. Why and do you do that? Why do you let it dry down? Just usually to, so it can dehiss. A lot of times we're collecting um, anthers before they've actually fully shed that pollen. So we get it, um, so when we are uh, making those pollinations, we're using the freshest pollen available. Okay. And then, um, so there's a process uh, for the female plant or the plant that we want to use as the mother. It's called emasculation. It's a fun, mm -hmm. uh, fun term for you there. Sure. And so, and that process is done to prevent that plant from pollinating itself. So in order to make a controlled cross, you'll first go in and collect that pollen. Like I said, take it back to the lab, let it dry down, let it dehiss, and then bring that back the next day. And that next day you're going to prep that mother flower. And that just means going in, removing the petals before it's fully opened, and then also removing the anthers before they've had a chance to dehiss. So we're talking about flowers that have all the potential parts. Correct, yeah. So uh, if you're not familiar with plant morphology, there are boy parts and there are girl parts in a flower. And some types of plants have boy and girl parts all in one flower, and some have them on different flowers. Right. And some of them even have them on two different plants. plants. Right. Yeah. So so if you're dealing with a plant that has a, a flower with both male and female parts, you do need to go in there and, and clean it up, so to speak. Correct. Okay. Yep. So there's a lot of hand work going on in yeah. here just to get a seed. Um, but you mentioned sometimes you use a pollinator, like a bee or... Um, some flowers are very difficult to, as you can imagine, yeah. to sit and clean up those flowers. And so there are chances that you'll get self-pollinations. Um, sometimes that's a good thing for us and sometimes that's not um, what we want, but those seedlings are easily sorted out when we, when we end up sowing them out. But flies and, uh, and bees are really good at moving that pollen around on very, very small flowers. Um, things like pieris, things like, um, hydrangea sometimes, spirea, things that are just very, very detailed flowers that are difficult to get into and, and clean up. So what would you do? Would you have like a protected area where you have the plants and, a, and the insects um, and let them go to work for you? We do use um, sometimes plants that seed a lot better if they're planted outside in their natural environment. So we will um, plan strategic plantings on plants that we just want to collect we call it open pollinated seed, but we really know which the two plants are that are probably um, exchanging pollen between the, the two. And then um, we have a couple excluded areas in a greenhouse that we can pull in um, the two plants that we would like to have crosses made, and then they are in there with a box of flies or a box okay. of bees. Um, and then we can even go on a smaller detail and use um, fly cages or seclusion cages. But Okay, yeah, and I've seen sometimes you will tie a bag over a flower. No, that's to control. Right. That's when I really. Um, that's when my control freak side kind of jumps. No, that's in. a good quality <laughs> in a plant breeder. There's validity to both types of crosses. Um, open pollination and you know strategic planting. You can get a lot of seed, um, especially if you're looking for one particular trait, a trait that you can select for early on, such as leaf color. Open pollination is is great controlled pollinations you can learn a lot from. So um, I would make controlled pollinations one if I do want to make those really wide inner specific or inner generic hybrids. If I'm going for sterility, if I'm going for a specific trait that one parent has the other one doesn't. I want to combine those two. Um, and the other thing that you learn from that is in your progeny you'll learn which parents are best. So um, if you know going into it, you know, you have a reblooming parent and none of the progeny ended up reblooming that the father had more control over that trait um, if the father wasn't reblooming. So you can really learn then. And so then in the, 
when you go to remake those crosses, Wygelia control. So um, if using a white Wygelia parent as the mother, um, it seems like in the few crosses that we've done, the male uh, parent controls the flower color. Really? Yeah. So. I would not have known that. Right, and I uh, wouldn't have known that either had we, had, I, uh, had we not made controlled yeah. pollinations. Yeah. So, There's yeah. probably a research project in there somewhere yeah. for some eager beaver uh, graduate student out there. So that's pretty cool. Um, so these are all things that you're doing that um, you have the plants that are, are they're cooperating. Like, however you manage to get the, pollinate, the pollen transferred, they are producing seed. Correct. But sometimes plants don't cooperate with that and they need a little bit of help. Correct. To produce the seed. Can you talk a little bit about what, why that would be and, and how you would correct for that or help the plant along? And so Jane's talking about a process called embryo rescue and that's what we would do um, to maybe help save those crosses. So most of the time, it, it usually is the case for making a wide cross um, and you get that pollen germination. So you make the cross of two different, maybe two different species within a genera or even two different genera crossed together. Um, the plants might have very similar genome size or they might be very similar enough for that pollen to grow down the stigma or on the other flower to set seed or to set you know little embryos in that ovule of the mother plant. However, let's say that seed would take over 100 days to fully mature. Mm -hmm. After a certain point with those cells dividing and growing and trying to become a seed, something signals like that this isn't right. Um, okay. The plant is getting a signal to it saying, you know, the pollen that was that pollinated these seed are, you know, are, is is way different. So there's something that is, um, it's a signal, it's an internal signal to the plant saying, nope, this isn't going to work. Yeah. So um, at that point, those those embryos or those ovules will just fall off the plant. Um, so when you make those controlled crosses. You are watching those crosses every single day, and you know you count how many days it takes for those for that plant to to get that signal saying, "Hey, these are we're way too different here. We're not going right, to be able right. to make a seed." Um, and so you remake those crosses. And so let's say it took 30 days for that plant to recognize mm -mm, this isn't going to happen. Um, you might go in at 28 days or 29 days, and then we have a tissue culture lab, or it's just a, okay. it's a sterile environment where we would take those ovules or even down to the seed level and we, we sterilize them. So we can insert a picture here and I can show what those ovules look like when we okay. take them up to the lab. We don't use a bleach solution, but something very similar to clean off any, any bacteria. So when that you're saying sterilize, you mean as in clean, clean. like operating theater yes. sterilization, yes. Yes. not like no, not, more, not <laughs> no more baby sterilization. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, so we bring those, those ovules up to the lab, we run them through a, a cleaning solution, and then under our laminar flow hood, it's again, it's a very sterile environment, we plate those in media that's made mm -hmm. with augers. Mm -hmm. It looks like jello, essentially. It's like sugar mm -hmm. and nutrients, and, and it's firm. And then uh, we sometimes will just place those ovules, if they're really small, on that nutrient media, and that gives them longer time to mature. And okay. we'll go in three or four weeks later and kind of excise that. And then you'll see the large developed uh, embryos that are in there or pre-seed. And then those get plated out on the media too. And those will then grow and mature and to become their own little plant or seedling. Okay. And that happens in the tissue culture lab. It happens in the tissue culture lab. So tissue culture at its most basic is ba just taking a piece of a plant and it could be, uh, in this case, a seed, or in some case, a piece of a leaf, or, or whatever, correct? And correct, yeah. Pick, pick whatever plant part is the right one, and putting little tiny pieces of it on this special, uh, it's a Petri dish uh -huh. with a solution in it that's like a nutrient base, I guess I'll call it. Sure. So that the plants have a base to grow from. 
So you do that for embryo rescue. And are there some other cases where we might use tissue culture? Sure. Um, so just very traditionally, tissue culture, you could think of it as like a mini production nursery. Mm -hmm. So it's just like if you would take, you know, all of our acres of liner production for plants that you can't usually get many cuttings off okay. of. Okay, you've got one really super awesome plant. Right. This is a way that you can make a lot of clones of that super awesome plant more quickly than old-fashioned cutting and sticking. Right, okay. yep. You know, if you have one large plant, you might be able to get five cuttings off of it at one one go, and you might not be able to recut it again for another couple months. Yeah. Some plants you can only recut one year. Um, so in the lab, at least it's a warm environment, it's a year-round environment, and um, most things are on a cycle every four to, to eight weeks, we will go up and redivide them. Okay. It's a pretty um, elaborate setup. It's not cheap and you have to have a pretty specialized uh, technical team to, to work in the tissue culture lab. So it's not something that's done just on a whim. Right. One of the other um, avenues that we use our tissue culture lab for is, I mentioned it's a sterile, it's a very clean environment, mm -hmm. is um, to import and export new plants to other countries. Certain plants are banned to be exported or imported into, let's say, Europe or New Zealand or wherever we would like to send some of our plants. So um, by growing them for a long term in the st clean, sterile environment and then the under inspection, we can ensure that they're not carriers for, let's say, a certain fungus or a certain bacteria. Yeah. And some plants we do get tested or screened to make sure that they don't have that before we initiate them into, into the lab. So it also serves us as a tool just to um, be able to get plants around in and out of the country. Okay. okay, that's really, that's important even if we're not shipping to a different country because I know it's not so much the case in flowering shrubs, but I know in perennials there are some plants that have some real problems with viruses and Correct. tissue culture means that you can produce very clean plants so that you aren't, um, without meaning to, sending a diseased plant out into the world where it might infect other plants. So, right. So it's a pretty important yeah. and valuable tool. It, it seems like there's a couple things that, that uh, I'm picking up from this, this whole discussion. And um, the first is that it sounds like a big, big part of plant breeding has to be record keeping. And you have to be a very detail-oriented person and be willing to take the time to take good notes and maintain good records. So I think that's something important for people to know. And that kind of uh, is especially important because it can take a long time to breed a plant. And right. How long does it? typically you have this idea you want to uh, have a purple flowered something that's whatever you've got a you've got an idea of what you want mm -hmm. and the first thing you need to do probably is acquire some germplasm some germplasm plants, yeah. which is a nice way of saying some parents plants mm -hmm. yeah and then how long does it take you from you've you've got some germplasm and you've got an idea and how long would that take you, Megan? So starting from square one, we don't even have the plants right now. Um, so you'd first, let's say, so Jane wants something purple that we don't have yet that's purple. So we would first go through the literature or go through records from different botanical gardens or nurseries just to see if, does that plant already exist? Maybe okay. maybe it already exists. Maybe we don't know about yeah. it. And yes, That's a great Jane's, point because yeah. we, don't, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Right. Or maybe something similar exists or something, again, similar exists in a different but closely related species. So um, let's say it didn't exist, but we found a purple leaf variety in a different species. So we first would then try to acquire that plant and bring it in. So once we get this plant that has the trait of interest that we want in it, um, then we plan a bunch of crosses with it. Which, what would this pair well with? You know, okay. what does Jane, Jane wants a mop head flower, um, but this one has a lace cap. Or we go through and we just start 
thinking of ideas like what would be the ideal best plant and start there. So then we would make the cross and um, we are so lucky these plants uh, are very closely related. They set tons of seed for us. Um, so we let that seed mature naturally on the plant. This is all in um, year one after we've acquired that plant. Okay. In a perfect world. In a perfect world. Perfect world, we're at year one. Right. So we let that seed mature naturally, and then um, we harvest it in the fall, clean the seed, not, not, not sterilize the seed, but clean the seed, like prep the seed, remove it from the ovules, sow it out, get rid of all the debris. We will then sow that in the spring. So it's still kind of in that one year. And then depending on, on those plants, most, most things will germinate one year from planting it, usually within a few weeks to a few months okay. after we plant it. There are a few plants that we work with that take two years to germinate. Two years. Two years. Um, so it's so a lot every, of waiting. Every cross, mm -hmm. you might have to wait two years. Right, and that's just on, um, on, on a few rare things. So ilex is what's called double dormant, or hollies are double dormant. Okay. Viburnums usually are double dormant. There are a few tricks you can use to break that dormancy, uh, treating them warm first. We do have a couple of different environments we can put seed in to try to speed up that two, <laughs> that two years. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but most things that we do work with um, in an ideal perfect world germinate within a few months from planting it. Sometimes right at that, um, you know, not necessarily the cotyledon stage, but that first set of true leaf stage, you can start seeing if we integrated color. So Jane wanted a purple leafed, I don't know, hydrangea maybe. Right. Uh, and so, and we crossed it with the green parent because we didn't have another purple leaf hydrangea. You can start seeing that in the seed bed, that diversity or that segregation or that, that, that trait is starting to kind of divide out. So at that point, we can start pulling out the best purples that we're seeing right there at that very first stage. So year one from making that cross. But then usually if it's a hydrangea, we won't see flowers on that for two years from the date we made that cross. So now we're up to three years. So we're up to three years from when we made that cross. So now we're out in the greenhouse and we have all of our best purple leaves all in one area and we're watching them bloom and we come across one that has the most magnificent flowered blooms on it that we've ever seen. So then the soonest we could make a selection would be three years. Three so years. we're gonna go in, that's called a selection. This is our best, our favorite plant out there. We're gonna select it and then we'll just give it an internal name. Um, Jane's favorite, we'll call it Jane's favorite plant. From there, we only have one plant and we've only seen it that one time. Yeah. And it's been it, taken care of, it's been coddled. Correct. So then we have a team that will come through and, and propagate that for us. So the earliest of selection was maybe three years from seed. So we select it. Now we have a selection called Jane's Favorite. Um, we had a crew come propagate it. Oh, let's, sometimes we're not lucky enough, but our goal is to try to get at least 38 plants okay. from, from one plant. So let's say it was big enough that we were able to get 30, 38 cuttings from that one plant. Those cuttings were taken in year three but we won't plant those potting, those cuttings up. They'll, they'll sit there in year three right. to root. Then in year four, we will pot them up to what we consider a trial size. And we usually trial things in three gallon containers, okay. but we really won't be able to evaluate them that first year in those three gallons. That first year is just for that plant to grow and develop. Okay. So we're uh, at six years we're at before we even have can look at them. Correct, and then from that stage, Jane's favorite is going to be planted out in the greenhouse and we're going to be evaluating Jane's favorite along with 40 other people's favorites. So Mine will win. Hers will be, a, but, I don't know, maybe. Uh, maybe. The best plant wins. Best plant wins. So after six years, you've got enough to watch, to have some, 36 plants, say. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to watch them in the greenhouse for a few years. 
and then Correct. And at that same stage, the reason why we propagate 38 is when they are all large enough, we'll take five of those 38 and we send them out to one of our research fields. It's all full sun, mm -hmm. very similar environment amongst everything that gets planted mm -hmm. out there. And then three of those plants then get put into a landscape trial. Okay. So those are get planted at uh, Dale Deppie's garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can evaluate them there as well. They're planted a little bit under shade, they're mulched, they're irrigated. Right. Dale's seeing them on a daily basis. And so they might be in the field and at Dale's, and then we have probably the, some still in, in the, the greenhouse. In the greenhouse, yep. So we and do a, a three you know, trial congruently right. at the same time. And you watch them for how long? A couple, three years? Uh, Three years at the earliest. At the earliest, okay. <clears throat> right. But so, so usually, what am I up to now? It's nine years. Yeah, it could be. So six years would be the first year that we would see them in their first trial, probably from okay. seed. Six years from seed in that first trial. Okay. So would it be fair to say it's going to be at minimum perfect world six years from conception to? evaluation and then another six years of evaluation. Would that be a fair statement? Not completely fair. One of the advantages that Spring Meadow Breeding Program has is that we are connected to this large uh, nursery, propagation nursery. So we know, we knew Jane's favorite from when it was a seedling and sometimes you can get a good feeling or not from there. And so in addition to during the trialing phase, we also have some plants that are set aside that we are um, increasing numbers on in okay. case we decide to make that decision. So we're ready to go. Yeah, and we're doing that on maybe our top five plants that we have the most hope for, and we might only introduce one of those plants, but we are also sometimes increasing our, our production numbers on it, so we are ready to go once we have vetted that plant from concept to maybe earliest introduction the soonest it would be was maybe seven years and that would be a plant being in a trial for at least three or four years okay okay uh, okay but that's that's fat that's pretty that's fast. fast and not not all plants most plants actually don't right we have um for instance we have one plant right now that we've had um for over 10 years that we've been wanting to introduce it but we can only propagate it once a year. So yeah, hydrangeas wow. are different. You can propagate them yeah. every yeah. three to four weeks or maybe every six weeks, I'm not exactly sure, but you can propagate them year round. So evergreens are more of a challenge because yeah. you can, we usually only prop them once yeah. a year. And so there's a huge investment. You're, you're growing a lot of plants on spec, so to speak. Right. The other thing that I'm seeing um, both from what you've told me and we've got some great images of you and your team at work is it is work and it's a lot of physical work. It might be small physical work with a paintbrush hand pollinating, right. but you're, there's, you're getting out there in the sun and moving things around and it's, it is a very hands-on task. Very hands-on task, yeah. and. Um, we're not doing anything that's not natural. No. We're not doing anything that a bee wouldn't be doing or that, um, you know, that wouldn't naturally occur. We're just trying to speed up the process and control the process a little bit. So, so right. that's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. People will throw around the world word hybrid a lot and um, usually in a derogatory way. So in terms of like the plant breeding world, like the definition of hybrid is just the offspring of two parents. It just means it's a cross. Or it's another word for a con potentially a controlled cross or it's a controlled hybrid. You can make native hybrids as well, even by crossing two different native plants. Every, even if you go and, and collect open pollinated native seed, They're those hybrids. are all considered hybrids usually. Um, right. Hybrid is just meaning, unless, usually hybrid's not used for um, for a selfed plant, but also I guess it, it might be, they're called self-hybrids. Um, so hybrid is just a generic term that plant breeders use, but yeah, it does get a negative, yeah. negative connotation, but like, everything is in my in my mind everything is a I, hybrid 
Um, my understanding of a hybrid was that, um, you know, if you have something that is a species, it's um, hydrangea macrophylla Jane. But a hybrid would be two species crossed. The out the offspring of that would be considered that's a hybrid. A, that's an inter interspecific hybrid. hybrid. Okay. Um, so, so it's just a yeah. A hybrid is tacked on at the end of introspecific. So the same plant okay. crossed. It's that's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Yeah. yeah. And hybrids occur naturally. They occur naturally within species and across species. Right. Yep. Yeah. Correct. I mean, there's. Viburnums are notorious for doing their thing with all the other viburnums. Oaks, willows. Oaks, willows, yeah. yeah. So it, it's not a dirty word, hybrid. It's, Hybrid's not a dirty word. It's, uh, yeah, it happens. And like I said, we, we and of that same, the way we use that term, we're all hybrids. We are. You're of your parents. So yeah. I'm a hybrid of my parents. What's the, Megan, what's the best part of your job? Uh, I guess the best part of, of my job is just the surprise, the not knowing. Okay. Um, one of the the best things about working with ornamental plants is that, yes, we always do start with this end goal in mind. So going back to like, yeah, we're looking for a purple leafed hydrangea plant for Jane, her ideal plant, but you don't know what you're going to find along the way. Uh, ornamental plants are, I'm going to drop a word in here, highly heterozygous meaning that there's a lot of diversity in those genes and so there's a lot of room for rearrangement when you make those crosses and so you're not just a lot of the the the, the seedlings that you're looking through um, there's tons of differences and so you don't even know where to begin there's dwarfs there's tall plants you get the red leaves but maybe you don't get solid red leaves and you get red around the edges and so just um, there's a lot of creative opportunity uh, when we look through plants. I love that you were, used the word creative because oftentimes I think that scientists are sort of dismissed as being not creative. Or if, or if it is brought up, it's used in a, a negative way. Sure. But science is inherently creative because you need vision and you, you need to be able to see all of the colors in the crayon box. And in your case, right. that crayon box is plants. Right. And you make beautiful things with that. Yeah. And um, I think it's a great thing for people to hear, especially if there are young people out there who are, who are into science. And um, maybe your friends don't think it's really cool because, I don't know, it's more cool to be a What's it cool these days? What's cool? I don't know. I have two teenage daughters. I am inherently uncool. Um, but science is, has a, so much opportunity for expression and creativity. And, and in the, at the end of the day, Megan has given so many people so many beautiful things in their lives. And I can't think of a better thing to be able to say about a career then you've made other people's lives beautiful. And you've done that. Yeah, thank you. So, go science. Yay, yeah. Plant breeding is definitely, there's a balance between art and science. You know, yeah. there's a lot that's up to chance, there's a lot that's up to design, but then there are a lot of science protocols and certain things happen because of science and yeah. it's repeatable well, because of science. If you're gonna be a musician, there are rules to music. Right. You have to learn to play the scales, that's part of it. And, um, but, and you make beautiful music. And if you're a scientist, you have to know the basics and you will make beautiful things too. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Yay us. Yeah. <laughs>